Hello and welcome back to Microsoft Research's Race and Technology Lecture Series. We've been bringing together leading scholars whose work is at the intersection of race and technology to address the many ways that these domains intersect. We've had speakers talk, speak to computer science, public health, computational biology, digital media, surveillance, and much more. And as we've made our way through these topics, we've seen many ways that race and tech construct one another and with what consequences. If you've missed previous lectures, you've heard me say this before, they're all available to you on YouTube and this one will be as well. Uh, today, I'm really, really happy we get to hear about gaming from Dr. Kishana Gray. She's giving us a talk titled Intersectional Tech, Black Praxis in Digital Gaming. Dr. Gray is an associate professor in writing rhetoric and digital studies at the University of Kentucky. She's been affiliated with MIT's program in comparative media studies and women and gender studies, Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and I am proud to say with my own research group at Microsoft Research, among others. Her work focuses on how black users in particular influence the creation of technological products and the dissemination of digital artifacts. She's the author and editor of four books on race, gender, and gaming, which you can actually see there on screen. Um, most recently, Intersectional Tech, Black Users in Digital Gaming, and Woke Gaming, Digital Challenges to Oppression and Social Injustice. I am going to be monitoring questions in the chat. Uh, I encourage you to get them in early. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can in the Q&A afterwards. Um, Dr. Gray says on her website that she is friendly even to trolls, and I will attest to this, although I will also request that you not troll, uh, but please do chime in. And a uh, quick heads up that on March 30th, we'll be hosting Dr. Tawana Dillahunt from the University of Michigan, who will be presenting a talk called Building With, Not For, a Case Study of Community-Driven Employment Innovations. So with that, let me turn over the screen to the fabulous Kashana Gray. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm Kishana Gray, Associate Professor um, of Writing, Rhetoric, and Digital Studies at the University of Kentucky. I am extremely honored to have been asked to take part of the race and tech uh, series um, that you all have been putting on. Um, you know, I've been closely connected with Nancy Bain for a while now, and just seeing her commitment to this work and this research has really been amazing. Um, and also her mentorship and support of me and my work for so many, really since I've I've been doing like, since my entire academic career um, has been really amazing. You know, just the encouragement um, has been great. And this is, you know, you know, on your screen is um, some of the the fruits of that labor, and also, you know, her mentorship. Um, really, um, you know, early on in my career, you know, I really was excited about gaming and research and gaming, right? Um, and I did my dissertation work uh, looking at online gaming communities. Wrote a book about Xbox Live, uh, your employer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I promise I said nice and encouraging things, um, but I, I knew that the focus of, of my energy needed to be on the gaming universe because there wasn't that much investment early on, like in the mid 2000s, right? You know, there wasn't that much focus, especially in the console universe. And I also focus a lot of my energy on Xbox Live um, because of the innovativeness of the technologies that just converge into that little black box. Sometimes the box is white, but um, I was really, I've just been inspired early on by Xbox because they were the first console to go live, right? They beat PlayStation and Nintendo out by, you know, several years, and they've always just been very innovative um, at, at making sure that they were staying abreast to the, the latest, like, conversations that were happening in the gaming space. The most recent acquisition of Activision and Blizzard is also a testament to that innovativeness um, and also their desire to really grow this metaverse, like, in, in gaming. A metaverse, which I argue, um, has been present inside, you know, Xbox Live for, for decades now, right? Um, and so some of that earliest work really focused on, you know, what the conditions were inside spaces. So the landscape of gaming really illustrated, you know, a, a lot of things related to representations, you know, how are women depicted, how are folks of color depicted and represented inside those, uh, inside those games. And that was, that was very useful and very telling. Um, and, um, and I, of course, in the latest book, Intersectional Tech, you know, I spent some time thinking about that, you know, specifically, you know, what do games say about race? 
but I, my, my energy has really um, often been focused on like the users and like the, the humans who are interacting inside that space. Like what are their experiences? You know, what's the nature of their realities when they go inside these spaces, especially when these games went live. Now, for those who are outside of like the gaming context, um, most of you probably can remember because you did research, you know, on, you know, what the Internet looked like, like in the 80s and 90s and stuff. And in the gaming space, a lot of those communities were still tech space. Right. You know, so I'm thinking about one of the biggest communities during that time in the mid 2000s was World of Warcraft. You know, those are heavily, you know, tech space community where the interactions, you know, you had to type it in. Right. But Xbox gave us something a bit, you know, something cool, right? They gave us, you know, uh, means to talk to people. Like the audio-based communities, I think, were very innovative. Um, but it also is, it made us, like, try, um, have to critique, okay, when we can talk to each other, what's being admitted into the spaces? What's being disclosed? Now, a lot of times for, for a lot of us, we're disclosing aspects of our, our identities that weren't that prevalent or um, before, like in the, in the text-based communities. So, for instance, I could text all day and never really, um, you know, there may be some subtle ways to tell, like, if um, my, my racial background or to tell, like, if I'm a woman, um, you know, but, but for the most part, we're able to, like, shield those aspects of our identities, now, a lot of early, you know, cyber and techno feminists, you know, had argued and urged that, oh, this was a way to really get a sense of what an equal landscape could look like, right? If we could just forego our bodies and we could see these, these spaces, then, then we could be equal in those, in, in those spaces, right? There was one, I remember in graduate school, reading an article um, um, about uh, some of the, um, the Yahoo chat rooms. And it was like a sex-based chat room, you know, some of the, the, the sex chat rooms, right? And so there was an interaction, you know, that somebody wrote a blog about. There was an interaction where this man and this woman were interacting, and, you know, he was describing all the things that he would do to this woman, right? All, all text. And then there was a line in there where he said, you know, I'm excited to rub my hands along your vanilla skin. Now, this woman, you know, in this, in this write-up, you know, so we, we see the excerpt, you know, in the blog, and, you know, there was a bit of a delay, because you could see the times, like, when the messages went through, and so then she, she says back, oh, that sounds really nice, I'm really excited, my skin's a little more mocha, my skin's a little more chocolate, I hope that's okay, and then there was a pause on his side. And then immediately, you know, the user, the man, you know, who's the user in, in, in this space, you know, he said, wait, you're black? Why didn't you tell me you were black? So he, you know, you know, and, and immediately the sexting stopped. Um, and then there was uh, there was some interactions of where they're going back and forth. And, you know, basically he's saying, you deceived me. Um, uh, your uh, this is an unethical practice. Um, you should have told me who you were. You should have disclosed to me that you were black. And I think that right there, you know, really illustrates what a lot of techno and cyber feminists, you know, uh, maybe cautioned, um, but but also I think what a lot of black feminists at the time had warned and, and, and showed that many of us cannot, um, we can't take off any aspect of our identity. And in fact, they work in tandem with one another and create a culmination of experiences for us, right? Um, a lot of marginalizing experiences, um, but nonetheless, you know, just, just experiences based on our race, gender, sexuality, our class, you know, all those things uh, come with us whenever we go into these online spaces. You know, so here, you know, I have that plethora of research, you know, Annette Markham, ZZ Papa Carisi, you know, you have all these amazing people, Nancy Bay, Mary Gray, you know, so we're inundated with all this research. And I wanted to know, what does this then look like inside these gaming spaces, right? And so, you know, I did a deep dive, you know, and, and, and did a lot of, of research to really um, try to understand, you know, what's the landscape for um, uh, at that intersection, um, but also, you know, um, for the most marginalized people like in, in those spaces. So what is intersectional tech, right? You know, I'm going to spend, that's actually a pretty slide. We'll just let that purple sit there because she's cute. But I'm going to read a bit to you um, because I think it's really important that, um, you know, this is straight from the book, that opening chapter, um, where I just wanted to just put it out there exactly what I'm talking about. Now, it's a lot of fancy words because, you know, academics like just do the most because that's what we have to do. But let me read this and then I'm actually, I'm going to break down these parts. Gaming, which often lies outside of conversations on blackness and digital praxis, is a medium that is becoming more visible, viable, and legible in making sense of black techno culture. 
Intersectional tech implores us to render visible the force of discursive practices that position users within disorderly social hierarchies and arrangements. The explicit formulations of the normative order sometimes disagree with the concrete human condition and are inconsistent with the consumption and production practices that constitute black digital labor. It is, in fact, these practices that inform the theoretical underpinnings of black performances, cultural production, exploited labor, and resistance strategies inside oppressive technological structures in which black users reside told you a lot of words but I promise you're gonna immediately get it so what is all those words what does intersectional tech then look like I think these are just a few images that really give us like that um just like a look of what it looks like so it is communities it is gamers it is spaces it is creating uh, utilizing platforms to sustain and enable you know communities you know uh, inside these spaces so on the left you know there's an image of black girl gamers black girl gamers was one of the first communities um, of where where black women came together to find one another in the gaming space you know it came to be like in the mid in the mid to late 2000s you know it was, I think it was a simple Facebook post where are my black women gamers that I think it was like something as simple as that and then that mobilized into an entire platform uh, now that has influence and boasts you know thousands and tens of thousands of, of women across the the black diaspora um, and it's a space where of, of of wanting to uplift and sustain you know um, you know black feminine identity um, inside gaming spaces and we also have Sonic Fox, you know, on the top right, um, you have Sonic Fox, um, who is the epitome of, of that intersection um, and the epitome of really of what gaming prowess is, right? So there's a bit of a story behind Sonic Fox. So Sonic Fox is one of the most prominent features of the fighting scene, right? Now, a few years ago, I'm so sorry, I can't remember the year right now, but Sonic Fox was awarded Gamer of the Year. Now, Gamer of the Year is an honor that goes out, you know, people vote and they decide, okay, who is the person who uh, should be awarded with this amazing accolade, right? And so Sonic Fox received that award. Now, during that same time, right, you know, when the gaming community is rallying around Sonic Fox, uh, a gamer called Ninja um, is on the cover of the ESPN magazine, and Ninja becomes the face of esports and gaming. Now, there are a couple things that are, you know, some people will be like, okay, so what? But there are a couple of things that are incongruent with that, right? Because Sonic Fox has basically, um, he's like the Michael Jordan of gaming. Let me just go ahead and say that, right? But so many outlets, so many mediated outlets said that Sonic Fox cannot be the face of gaming because Sonic Fox is black and queer. So the fact that his brand of masculinity doesn't fit within what the gaming world said um, a gamer could be um, really illustrates exactly the fact, uh, exactly what intersectional tech is talking about, right? So intersectional tech, drawing on the work of the other folks who were part of this series, drawing from the work of Andre Brock, Rua Benjamin, Sophia Noble, you know, all these folks have said that there is um, uh, under the surface and also and very overtly that there is this white landscape, this white masculine landscape in which all of these technologies um, are, are springing out, right? It's the root the root of it is full of white masculine supremacy, right? And so the fact that Ninja, who is a white man, you know, becomes the face of gaming, you know, that is really signifying like a particular narrative um, that the gaming world wants to put out to say, okay, this is the universal ideal. The universal is the default. The universal is white and the universal um, is man. Now, I talked about a lot of that in Race, Gender, and Deviance in Xbox Live about how because of that gaming landscape, because of who gets catered to, because of who gets targeted, that we have assumed that the gamer is a white man. And then whenever there's a presence of the other, then there are um, swift lashings because uh, folks who look like me and others, you know, have deviated from the norm in which the gaming space has wanted to create, right? So just by the fact of his existence, the fact that he doesn't care, the fact that he is still balling out, you know, he said he doesn't care about what they're framing and what they're saying, the fact that he is there and present. Um, and I think that that really embodies um, what what intersectional tech uh, means. That lower uh, that lower image is a lab at one of our HBCUs. That's a gaming lab because a lot of money has been invested around esports um, into, into our historically black colleges and, and universities.
Now, so what that image is showing us, it's that showing that there are some institutional infrastructures that are enabling um, and hoping that there is a presence of more black and brown bodies inside these spaces. Because the landscape of esports, it really looks, um, primary, as I said earlier, primarily white and male and secondarily, you know, East Asian and male. And so there's this concerted effort from like a lot of institutions, you know, to make sure that there are these diverse bodies presence, that, that there are folks who, who, you know, have a say in what a lot of these esports programs look like. You know, they have a say in what, um, you know, these gaming spaces look like. Um, and so I think that they, that this is, um, this is a good, um, um, a good visual um, of really what intersectional tech, tech uh, is, um, of what it does, right? So that was the question, what it looks like. That's the visual of what it looks like. So what it is. So I want to read this quote from one of the interviews that I had um, in, in my lab, from some of my lab work. Ain't no internet at home. Ain't no Wi-Fi. I stole this galaxy. If I wasn't here at a public library, there's no telling what I'd be doing. Damn show wouldn't be Fortnite. Let me read this again. Ain't no internet at home. Ain't no Wi-Fi. I stole this galaxy. If I wasn't here, there's no telling what I'd be doing. A damn show wouldn't be Fortnite. I, um, in the course of a lot of the work that I do, um, so, you know, I research these online communities, but I also spend significant time in physical spaces, especially the spaces who have, um, who have mobilized themselves to be gaming publics, right? You know, so libraries, um, there are also, you know, different kinds of like, you know, uh, gaming spaces that, you know, places that put like consoles, you know, in public spaces. So I, I, I'm really interested in seeing, uh, you know, how we create uh, gaming publics, right? And there are a lot of exclusionary practices, right? So on campuses, you know, where I spend a lot of my time, you know, there are exclusionary practices of who can participate in those gaming publics, right? You know, so the Smash Brothers uh, group, the Pokemon group, those spaces are very male and very white, right? Um, and so uh, a lot of places that I've, I, some of my work, you know, I try to mobilize, you know, other publics like the public library, you know, to be these counter spaces and to be, to be these alternative spaces where we can have more diversity, you know, really where black and brown folks like can be um, because the other spaces are really not welcoming to them, right? But there's also something a little bit more additional to this story. So this, this, this happened, I, I got this interview whenever I was in Chicago. So at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I was interviewing folks. Um, during the summer, the summer right before COVID, uh, COVID really disrupted this project. But but anyway, um, so it was the summer right before COVID. It was the Pokemon Go Festival that happens in Chicago of every year. So this group that I had been working with, you know, there were a group from the south side of Chicago and Inglewood specifically. They uh, were very excited um, about, you know, participating in the Pokemon Go Festival. So this was early in our relationship, right? So, um, you know, I just got connected to them. The Pokemon Go Festival was happening. So I was like, hey, come on up here. Let's do Pokemon Go. Teach me how to play. I was action. I was asking them to teach me, you know, how to play. So I I was there. I said, hey, I'm meeting you here. Um where are you at? So I was texting. Um, they said they're on their way. So a lot of time had passed and I was wondering where they were, um, you know, because I was going to meet them. So for those of you who know Chicago, we're going to meet at the Bean, you know, that little, that ugly mirror Bean looking thing um, <laughs> in the park. So they never came and they said, actually, we, we were asked to leave. We got kicked out. I was like, what do you mean? They said, you know, one of the security officers um, said that um, an event was happening and basically that they weren't welcome and they needed to go. And I was like, well, did you tell them that you were meeting a professor from the University uh, uh, of, uh, from UIC? And they said, no, no. You know, they said they didn't want to disrupt any spaces and they were just used to this kind of treatment um, because they are. Um, from the narrative, you know, from from Chicago, the anti-black narratives from a lot of our cities were that they, they were black bodies out of place. Um, and that they needed to get back on the train and get back to the south side, right? So I was like, I was mad, right? So um, I went, of course, I complained. It, it went nowhere because, you know, somebody said that they, the kids were actually being disruptive, right? So I was like, well, forget this. Forget Pokemon Go Fest. We can do Pokemon anywhere. You know, because what I knew about the game was that, you know, it just it's like a geolocation, um, you know, kind of game. If you have a phone and you've got like an open, safe space, then you can do Pokemon Go anywhere, right? So when we went down to their neighborhood, I was like, let's go do Pokemon Go. Let me skip a few lines here. Um, so when we went to, the, to their neighborhood to do Pokemon Go, there weren't that many Pokego stops. I was like, hmm, this is very interesting. 
because I just came, you know, from Millennial Park. It just came from, uh, it was a South Loop. Yeah, the museum came. We just came from South Loop where there was a plethora of Pokeco stops. So this sent me on a deep dive, you know, to try to figure out how are Pokeco stops assigned? Because immediately in my mind, I'm like, oh, this is racist. You know, <laughs> this is racist. This is what my immediate thinking was. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't that wrong, but let, let me tell you. So we went to the Niantic website. And we found that in order to have a pokey go stop, you know, there are certain um, criteria that needed to be met. So it had to be, um, uh, it had to have sidewalks. It had to be uh, a generally safe space in which to occupy and walk and to get there, you know, to make sure that, you know, people aren't putting themselves in har harm's way. And also it had to uh, be a site of some kind of significance. It had to be like a landmark or something pretty important, right? So that's why we see like a lot of these in touristy areas, you know, areas where there are monuments, um, like maybe, you know, significant parks, you know, that's where we, where we see a lot of pokey go stops. So in Englewood, I'm like, okay, why don't we have any here? And so we tried to submit, you know, to get some pokey go stops like down there, but they had deemed the area uh, un unsafe and it wasn't enough sidewalks and it wasn't like enough uh, public throwaway, throwaways to, to have pokey go stops. So in my mind, I was like, okay, well, we got to change this narrative, right? But also, I think it highlighted something very si significant um, because this game really reified um, how, how much we make sense of space, um, public spaces, private spaces, whatever. But it's just the constructions uh, and narratives like around space. So who has access to space? Who can occupy a space? Who's asked to leave a space? All of those things are significant questions that, that we've seen in other, you know, in other literatures, like in other spaces. But I thought it became very significant to talk about space like within a gaming, gaming context. And I thought it was at a very powerful convergence of looking at space, like looking at infrastructures and looking at physical space, but also looking at the cyberspace, especially if it's overlaid on top of it, kind of like the Pokemon Go, um, um, uh, th that game, the geolocation kind of game that utilizes a phone and utilizes maps, right? And and I, I in the book, sorry, I didn't put a page number on this one. Um, it, it really made me think about... Um, you know, all of the, the, the legacies of redlining and Jim Crow and looking at how those legacies are manifesting inside these spaces, right? Like when, when we look at, at this map here, if we were to look at like a larger map of Chicago, these pokey ghost stops were exactly, they were demarcating racialized space in the city of Chicago. You could look on the west side of the city, which is a black neighborhood and see almost no pokey ghost stops. You can look on the south side and see almost no pokey ghost stops. You can look at areas like Pilsen, which are, you know, brown, you know, Mexican Latinx like neighborhoods and see almost no pokey ghost stops. So, so Pokemon Go basically was reifying, you know, the redlining in racial racially segregated practices that these neighborhoods and these these cities had implemented right now the same thing happens especially with you know i'm continuing this project especially since you know we're finally getting some 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 sense of what our normal is in, in the midst of COVID. the same thing is happening especially in appalachia you know when we go to eastern kentucky where there is no there's no wi-fi there are no fiber optic cables there's no digital infrastructure that could facilitate something like that but th those are the same conversations that are happening you know, with, with, um, within physical spaces, right? And so I think that, you know, this gives us, let me go back to this quote here. This really gives us a way to just see how space is like reinforcing um, and, and, um, and, and reifying some of those social practices. And I think that is a core tenet of what intersectional tech is talking about. You know, we can't look at technologies as independent from one another. They are influenced by their creators and designers. They are influenced by the existing infrastructures in the space. They are influenced by racialized and gendered legacies, you know, that, that came before them. So there's no way to just argue that technology is neutral um, because it doesn't exist in neutral conditions. So let me read this quote right here. Space is not just a passive backdrop to human behavior and social action, but it's constantly produced and remade within complex relations of culture, power, and difference. So there was no way for us to have a game like Pokemon Go and to not, you know, have these things reinforced because this is what our, our infrastructure, um, this is what, what has built our digital infrastructures.
Now, something else that I think this this project with Pokemon Go and, you know, my interactions with the young folks on the South Side really illustrated was that there are these new pathways to adopting gaming technologies. Um, and I spent a lot of time early in, in my in my career, you know, uh, in the research of like the, the diffusion of innovation theory and looking to see how does one adopt a technology? You know, what are the factors that influence, hey, who gets the iPhone and who gets a droid? You know, what influences if somebody gets something the day something drops versus a waiting a little little while you know like so that all those conversations related to like the early adopters and then who were the laggards right now of course it's no surprise that you know there are some factors that influence that right um and some of those factors are associated with our identities you know so class is a huge indicator right you know do you have the access and the means and the resources to be able to purchase those kinds of things which is why the concerns around the pay to play game is really creating you know furthering you know divides along along lines of class Um, but also gender is a huge indicator especially you know there's a of course research you know shows us you know there's a, a leaky pipe in stem where women girls femme non-binary folks trans folks are actually you know uh, um are actually um basically told to leave the cultures are not made for them these are masculine spaces and then uh, other folks you know who want to participate they're actually you know filtered out you know through all kinds of like cultural um um uh, hidden curricula is like they're filtered out through the hidden curricula um but i also think that this really highlighted you know some of the directions that i think a lot of our our, uh that tech companies of course are going you know they realize this over reliance like on mobile devices now so for the mobile devices Or if we go back to this quote here, right, you know, that mobile device is not just a device for you just to go and do something like in a recreational or leisure way. This is like your lifeline, right? This is the lifeline because they're, um, you know, it's your lifeline to figure out like directions to know when like the train is going to be there so you can make it home on time. Like, so, you know, if there's like no, no uh, phone at home, then, you know, that mobile phone that you stole off the, from this lady on the train, sure, it sounds bad and awful, right? You know, I didn't talk about that part, but think about the conditions in which a lot of these young folks are even living into, you know, where they're, they're forced to have to, you know, steal that latest phone or steal that galaxy because society is telling them to have it. They don't have the means and resources to go get it and so you know there are just like uh, you know crimes of opportunity where they're hopping off a train they'll grab somebody's phone and just hop on off with them as well you know and then they'll take the sim card out get a new sim card you know they told me the whole process you know it's really it's, it's a really well-oiled machine um and, and it's very sad you know because a lot of these you know kids are caught then you know they're you know they're scooped up in into the the um to the justice um system um in really really awful ways um, uh, so one of the other pathways is also, in addition to the reliance on mobile devices, is also the reliance on public Wi-Fi. So if we go back to this map here, Chicago touts itself as like one of the most wired places in the world. So very wired city, a lot of access to, to public Wi-Fi, right? So if you look at the map on the left that shows the Chicago hotspot Wi-Fi map. Uh, this is, these maps are all of the same locations. So I want you to know, this is all, we're all in Inglewood, um, and we're all on the south side. So if we were to look at the uh, the Wi-Fi map, let's say on South Loop or West Loop or University Village, right, where UIC's campus is, you would see a lot of those blue dots. Those blue dots indicate access to Wi-Fi, right? And so if you go down to the south side of the city, you know, if you go to the west side of the city, if you look at areas like Pilsen, you know, um, you won't see, you barely will see any. So there is no access, you know, to these to these basic infrastructures that a lot of these cities are just touting and just espousing as like, oh, look at how great we are, because there are still significant have nots, you know, people who don't have access to, to that stuff who need it the most. Now, nowhere was this this disparity most visible. Um, but after COVID and um, during COVID and trying to get young folks access to remote learning, right? the city basically buckled underneath itself and it still is, you know, every day, you know, there's something about, you know, the city of Chicago and schools and, you know, we've got to have kids inside the schools because, you know, the, the, the mayor indicated that whenever the kids are at home, they don't have connections to them because a lot of these kids don't have internet. So parents are not getting those emails. These young folks are not able to, you know, go do the remote learning. So really like being in the classroom is imperative for them, but we're missing the point of the conversation. We're missing the conversation about how infrastructure is not equitable across the city. 
you know, when you look at the north side of the city, of course, remote learning worked out perfectly because these young folks were just able to seamlessly go into there because of all the cultural and social capital that, that they had. But because their infrastructure was also, you know, um, suited, you know, for, for the conditions of, of, of something like a pandemic, right? Um, I also, um, let me see, right, let me keep, let me keep on moving because I want to make sure that I am not wasting too much time. Oh, the other one, the other path to adopting gaming technology, which is, which is what these projects are really illustrating is the, the reliance on public safe spaces and safe access to public spaces. I think that's one of those com one of those pieces to that conversation that you don't often hear about. Oh, look at these public infrastructures. Oh, you got access to Wi-Fi, but are those spaces safe? You know, for for people to utilize. So something that's also also important uh, to know about Pokemon Go, right? So whenever we we did have a few Poke Go stops, right? And so if you can see, you know, the few stops on the on that right side of their map, there were um I think when the, the there were a couple more that were implemented, they were around um like statues that were in the area, parks and statues. So, you know, they were doing a little bit better. But if you know much about the city uh about the south side, um a lot of those neighborhoods are uh, I'm trying to think about a sensitive way to say this. There are a lot of gangs. There's a lot of gang activity, you know, so just crossing the street, you can be in one gang's territory, you know, on, on one side of the street and be in another, like on, on the other side of the street, right? Um, so I'm not going to go into, you know, to all the scholarship, you know, around why that is and why, why that happens. A lot of us know, but I'm just going to go to the fact of, of how people have, um, uh, basically modified their lives in order to exist and survive, you know, within this narrative. So in order for those young folks to be able to play Pokemon Go, there was this group, Mask, Mothers and Men Against Senseless Killing. Ma mothers, mothers and Men Against Senseless Killing, excuse me. So basically what they would do, these were women who would just occupy corners on the streets to just ensure that the kids could cross one street into another and walk safely into like the neighborhoods. And that's why this map in the middle is so important and significant, right? So during the summer, there's a lot of free time. There's a lot of idle time. There's a lot of um, just downtime, like for young folks, right? So a lot of kids, they spend their time at their closest library because they don't have anything else to do. And they want to, you know, a lot of parents, of course, want to keep their kids off the street and keep them busy, you know, so they don't, don't get involved with a lot of, you know, some of the violence that, that is around them. So in order, so for instance, a lot of these young folks, um, they would, they develop these really cool hybrid networks of gaming uh, to play. And I, I use hybrid networks, um, but essentially what they were doing was going to the library, using the Wi-Fi and playing Fortnite on the phone. So I remember back to the quote, right? There was a reason that these young folks needed the Galaxy, right? So the little cheap phones that they had could not push Fortnite. The little phones that they had could not push Call of Duty. They wanted to play those games. They didn't have consoles. You know, mobile gaming is the way to play for a lot of them now, you know, because, you know, a lot of, you know, parents can't just afford that. So what they would do is that they would get these phones and they would download those games onto the phones. Now, they didn't have Wi-Fi at home, right? So then they would, a lot of them would go to these libraries in order to have access to play the game, right? Okay, so they're here, they're in these libraries, and they're playing, right? So they have some friends that are across the neighborhood. So you would have, you know, like Jamal and Jason, like, would go to Thurgood Marshall. You know, you would have, you know, Pablo and Chris, they would be at, at the Inglewood branch. So but they would be in all these spaces, and then they would get together, and they would play. Now, I define this as, like, hybrid networks um, for gaming, um, because here are these folks, you know, these young folks were like, okay, we don't have any other way to play so we have to figure it out on our own so I thought that that was so innovative and so amazing and so powerful that they realized you know what they could do but now remember as they're walking remember they know in their mind that if they got the wrong colors on that if they have to you know cross you know 63rd they know that that's not a great thing if they so they know these things right and so the women in the neighborhood mostly it's women who are just occupying these corners in these neighborhoods so that the kids would be able to cross the street to just get to the library right now sadly uh during during that time there was actually a woman who was killed it was just a stray bullet you know there were cars that were just um you know riding by and they, they were shooting at each other and one of the mothers actually um was killed you know uh just on the street corner just making sure that the kids could um could just cross and have recreation and have a semblance of of, of normal um right 
Um, and so I think it's um, really important that we realize just how the humanness, how um, how important humans were in this infrastructure. So I spent a lot of time talking about the Wi-Fi, right? Yes, the Wi-Fi is important. Spent a lot of time talking about, you know, these public spaces. So the library is important. But also what, what gets missing is like the, the people, you know, the mothers, you know, the men and mothers who were just, you know, making sure that their kids could, cr could cross the street. So there was like this nexus of things that were enabling, you know, th this this to happen. So that was a really necessary example to illustrate why intersectional tech matters, right? Um, and I think this quote here really is just summarizes it about how, you know, black women were behind the scenes of all of these things to enable like, you know, young folks to happen. So when black women claim space, it changes the world, right? Um, so I, I really, you know, thought about, you know, the, the black women who enable the infrastructure, but it was also black women at the public library, right? Um, you know, because they were the women who were like supervising the young folks. Uh, they were the ones who were, you know, working at, in that space. And they were also the ones that were really advocating. There was a story at one of the libraries where, you know, one of the librarians, a white woman, you know, she was concerned about all the time that these young folks were, um, how they were wasting their time playing games. And it was this black woman, she was a volunteer, you know, this black woman said, they're here and they're safe and they're occupying their time doing something. We leave them alone, basically, really. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, the librarian had to fall back. Um, you know, of course, this black woman, she had a lot more choice for us for this librarian. You know, she's like, leave my kids alone. You always harassing our kids, right? But that also illustrated an important thing about how sure these spaces are, are spaces, you know, that, that can mobilize, you know, a lot of like that gaming and, and that connectivity and interactivity. But these spaces also need to make sure that there's space, you know, for us to be in. Um, because of that narrative, the anti-black narrative, especially in a space in a city like Chicago, you know, they had to basically be trained to understand, you know, a group of black boys hanging in the library is not a threat to you, right? And so that's what I realized, you know, in the projects that I'm doing, I realized that those folks, they need most of the training, you know, before we even go in or before, you know, we bring some young folks in, like for the workshops or different things we were doing or to have like little lab time, that those folks had to be trained and had to develop some cultural competencies or whatever DEI word, you know, basically don't be racist. That's basically what, like, don't be racist to, the, to these black bodies, black brown bodies who are coming into these spaces but it's black women who are at the forefront of making sure that their kids are protected um, in that regard let me read a couple a uh, couple passages from the book intersectional tech implores us to render visible the force of discursive practices that position users within disorderly social hierarchies and arrangements now if you can recall at the beginning i read that big old definition of intersectional tech and i think you know since you have those different examples you can actually see and we break these definitions we break the the that say um um break up that that paragraph about intersectional tech when we break it up we can actually see what's happening right intersectional tech implores us to render visible we have to make those invisible practices of exclusion, of racism, sexism, we have to make those visible, right? So in that library, we had to check those librarians. I'm like, you're not getting ready to, you know, use all this anti-black like language like towards these kids who are just trying to find a, a safe place, right? Because what they were doing, you know, the librarian was reinforcing the social hierarchies. The security guards at the Pokemon Go Festival was trying to reinforce the social, social hierarchies, the, the racial hierarchy that put black folks at the bottom in, in those spaces, right? But intersectional tech, you know, forces us to to, to, to highlight those discursive practices and to highlight the rhetoric and everything that was involved at, at, at establishing those conditions in the first place, right? So that way that we are not bodies that are just out of place. We are bodies that have been constructed and reconstructed as deviant and as undesirable. And then intersectional tech was like, no, these we are resisting those kinds of things. And we are showing you like a different way. We are modeling what some of these, what, what, what these things should be and what these spaces should look like. These spaces should be feminist. These spaces should have a critical race dance these spaces should be intersectional at their core and i'm gonna skip ahead because i know i never i'm running out of time um actually actually no i gotta take some time on, on this one of the other things that was really um really important i don't know how i may i think i'm missing this slide here but it's okay um one of the things that also came out from intersectional tech was one of the black women from from one of these communities and spaces said we should have never turned our hobbies into a job now this is uh illustrative of a lot of the streamer culture that's happening in gaming right um but uh she um she made a great point she said you know these these technologies were not designed by or for us so they never really factored us or never really factored us into like the equation of of what successful users inside the space could be and this this quote uh this this comment came off the heels of the uh 
the leak from Twitch. So Twitch is, uh, for those of you who don't know, Twitch is uh, it's a streaming platform. So um, hopefully you know what streaming is. But just quickly, if you don't know what streaming is, it's like um, if it's like if I'm playing a video game and I have a game or doing anything else. It's like if you're doing something and providing the commentary on it, Twitch is like a platform that enables you to be able to do that. Okay, the, uh, you have to go Google it. But anyway, Twitch, there was a major leak at Twitch. And then they revealed some of the top um, the top earners. Um, the people who made the most money off this platform, right? And so when a lot of folks in the space, rec- you know, we recognize these names, these are very common, and these are prominent names inside streaming culture, we realized that most of them were all, uh, they were all male, and most of them are white. Um, there was a few of them that were, that were men of color. Um, but from Black Girl Gamers, you know, there was, a, um, you know, I'm going to read this quote here. Um, wow, it seems like mostly white men creators who make the most money in gaming that doesn't seem to balanced. And so everybody was saying, oh, these are huge disparities. Oh my gosh, these men have such these huge platforms and oh, this is happening. And it's been folks like black girl gamers, you know, these black and brown and indigenous women who have been saying, hey, these are the results of the disparities. Like you're not going to generate, you're not going to grow something, you know, assume that it's neutral and then expect, you know, all of the, all things to be equal. You know, once it grows its tentacles and its arms and, and its legs and, you know, you can't all, all of a sudden then expect things to be all equal but that's really what um what the assumption was that like hey anybody can stream you can develop your platform we all can make money but this this list revealed that that was not the case and i think that's another important part of like intersectional tech because it it illustrates you know how you know techno culture is like just is embedded with all of these social infrastructures and and, and social inequalities um and that tech is not neutral right so we have a plethora of 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 examples that illustrate that so my bad. So if we, sorry, that was that. So if we think about what I had just said about, you know, about creating the model, my bad. Um, if we think about, you know, how black women are so necessary to creating these models, you know, we have a lot of different examples inside the gaming spaces, right? Um, and so, so for instance, I'll, I'll go ahead and switch to the, some of the things uh, that I'm doing and, and why I'm here at Kentucky, right? You know, so I was recruited to come to the University of Kentucky because of the amazing things that they were doing like around esports, right? But there are a lot of people who were behind the scenes in that conversation, you know, that were aware of all the public conversations, aware of all the, um, the focus on on just making money, you know, the business models that that have been co- um, brought into to these narratives, but also how white these spaces were. And they were like, maybe we can do something different. Maybe if there's like a different way that we can exist and be inside these gaming spaces. And so I've, you know, kind of taken upon myself to just do what I do and just do it here in the space. And I think that, you know, we um, were working to make sure that, you know, first, you know, there are teams, like whenever we give it advice or consulting around like esports teams, we make sure that that call is wide, that you're not just going to get like a team that just has a bunch of white dudes on it, right? You want to make sure that you're being, act- you're actively like recruiting women and folks of color and other people who are, uh, who are like on, on a campus in particular. And you also have to make sure that some of the games, you know, you know, feature diverse content. So here's this, uh, that picture at the top left is us playing hair and awe, like in an esports setting, you know, so that's usually not a game that you would see in some of those spaces. So hair and awe was created by Momo Pixel, a black woman basically, you know, uh, you should h- look up hairnod.com. You could play it right now. Um, but it's basically swatting away hands for people trying to touch your hair and trying to touch you. So that's a game that, you know, has all kinds of um, uh, amazing um uh, there are all kinds of conversations that could be generated around, you know, a game like Hair and Awe. Um, and so I think that, you know, us, and also there's an example here from um, from the University of Hawaii, you know, Scott, Sky Kaoleo, you know, he's doing like amazing things um, at, at, really, it's like this East meets West, you know, he's like, okay, wh- we want to, you know, here you have, you know, the Asian countries and the United States and North American countries, they they are, you know, prominent features in these conversations around esports. But what are the conditions of the players, you know, so Sky spends a lot of his time in the University of Hawaii has given us a beautiful model of making sure that the player and the user, you know, is taken care of and, and like protected. And these are all examples of, of, of intersectional tech. Um, so I think there were a few slides I didn't get through, but it's okay. Um, but I want to make sure just to, uh, just to uh, reify that a lot of these models were based off of black women's recommendations, um, uh, based off of black and brown women's like experiences in these spaces. And I think a lot of these uh, places are finally listening, um, you know, to these women 
women, to these women, non-binary and trans folks who have been at the forefront, you know, at a lot of these conversations. So really at the core of intersectional tech is resistance practices and um, practices of mobilization to make sure that communities are protected, not just in a digital space, but also in the physical realm as well. Thank you. That was, that was just wonderful. Thank you so much for that talk. Thank you, Nancy. So deep, so many ways to go in. Um, there's some interesting questions in the chat. And then, of course, I have a million. Um, <laughs> but early on, early on, you, 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 you talked about, uh, you, you just sort of dropped the line about, oh, the metaverse and next, has already existed in Xbox Live. And then later you went into just that beautiful discussion about space, both in terms of in-game or in mm -hmm. online, but also the many ways it's embedded in the, the landscapes of cities and whatnot. And I'm, I, I guess, I guess I got a, a, a few questions. Some are mine and some are audience ones. So first of all, when you hear that rhetoric about the metaverse is as the, where the future of work is going to be and it's going to, you know, it's going to be so great because we're all going to be on level ground and it's going to be equal. No, nah. no, nah. there's just no way. Like, how can that happen? You know, I think, you know, you know, the, you know, folks have really are well intentioned and they mean well. Um, but like for me, you know, I always think about, you know, from the scholars, you know, folks who have talked on this series before, you know, scholars like Rua Benjamin, you know, Professor Noble, you know, Professor Brock, who have talked about like the foundations in which these tech industries like they grow, like the roots are not are not equitable and equal and inclusive and diverse. You know, so how can we all of a sudden then expect, you know, to have these beautiful models where everybody can participate on equal ground? You know, let's just assume that sure we we can, like we're also just missing like the the infrastructure to support these kinds of things. Now those are some of the conversations that I don't think we talk about enough. You know, think about there's still gonna be folks who are left out who can't keep up. You know, and that gaming is 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 such an, a great illustration of that. Um, and of course, the cost to just be able to participate and play, you know, that's why we always have these class distinctions between, you know, PC gamers and console gamers, you know, PC gamers, you know, they have access to resources to be able to get graphics cards and gaming cards and, and to get, have fiber optic, you know, um, internet and all that stuff. And then, you know, the, some of those kinds of conversations fall off when we think about like a console gaming environment. And then even more so, like, you know, when it comes to like, uh, you know, folks who only have access through mobile and then folks like who don't at all. So these are not equitable, you know, platforms. They're not equitable spaces. And so the, the but, but also I think, you know, aside from that, you know, we can also, you know, think about the celebratory nature of, you know, just how innovative gaming has been and every, all the inspiration that we can draw, you know, from these gaming spaces, you know, from Second Life, you know, all the, the amazing things that, that happened, you know, with, with the environments that were built like in Second Life. So we're not starting from scratch. And I guess that's why I'm just so upset with these kinds of conversations that people are like, oh, we're trying to create this thing that's new how are we going to do it well first off let's just start you know take a look to see what has been done before so we don't do the same missteps you know that a lot of those spaces you know have have done you know from second life you know from the online gaming communities and platforms you know let's 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 have some best practices going into there and i don't think i i don't hear enough conversations about that well that leads so perfectly into the next the next sub question on the metaverse kind of question, which is as folks are thinking about designing yeah. metaverse and are actively doing so, and as as people are imagining um, work moving in there as well as play moving in there, what are some um, what are some lessons? What are some use the best practices phrase? What are some things that designers can do? And also, what are maybe some of the limits of design and some things that designers should not do? Yeah, absolutely. I think I remember giving a talk a few months ago, and I think the title of that talk was what can we learn from what other like from from failures, like learning from failing. Right. Because I think that's kind of where we are in a tech world and really mostly like in a, the gaming tech kind of world. You know, we see all of these all the missteps that that have happened and that have transpired, you know, from, you know, not having diverse teams, you know, not having a big enough table, you know, for folks to be there. So I think even at the ideation phase and I'm not sure, I, you know, when we think about the metaverse, I think a lot of this has already happened. It's been thought out. And then they're kind of like just like in deployment phase. But I think when we think about like design justice, you know, the amazing work that, you know, uh, Sasha, Sasha 
Cassandra Shock has has done, you know, with with their book, um, you know, we have like a good template of how can how we can like be radical and transformative and like you know dismantle some of those social hierarchies. You know, I'm thinking about the the last few slides. You know, I'm thinking about like intersectional tech. You know, tech is just reifying. You know, some of those those hierarchies that are already like existing. So one of the things that we can do are you know who. We bring we bring the best and brightest like on on a lot of these teams uh, aboard. You know, people who have these amazing degrees, but you know they aren't the only ones that can contribute to those conversations. So I think we can widen that up. You know, widen that. Uh, you know, uh, bring more spaces at the table so we can have people who are like activists. You know, think about like I, I love what we learn. You know, during like the movements for Black Lives, like just how mobilization and 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 uh, social movements can be facilitated using social media. You know, I think we have something beautiful that we can learn from. I'm thinking about so many. Of these platforms where you know harassment campaigns were levied upon you know women and folks of color you know trans folks and a lot of those folks have to implement their own safety measures like for protection you know before these platforms before twitch and discord you know before so many of these spaces even started thinking about protecting you know the most vulnerable populations in these spaces you know so we can learn from them like you know what how do we protect these folks how can we ensure that you know if there are you know people inundating a space and you know leading to toxic practices how can we get them out of here you know What's like what? What's the complaint systems? How do I report people? You know, I don't think there's like enough thought and intention behind it. And that's one of my complaints all the time of like Xbox Live. That Xbox Live doesn't want to capture racism because if they did, they would have an option in there for me to report. Oh, a racism just happened to me, but that's not in that space. So there's like even even those reporting systems, they have valuation built into them. They let me know what's important to them. I think a few right on the backs of Gamergate. You know, finally in some of those systems, they have like a gender based harassment option you know with the rise of like the me too movement you know the you know all the the cases around like sexual harassment so you can see like a paradigm shift in among a lot of these industries that are like okay maybe we should care about this but we haven't gone far we haven't gone far enough like at all so so i think first off we got to listen to the most marginalized you know the people who have really been subject to the most harms in these spaces and ask them hey how can we do these things better yeah yeah great point um, let me switch gears for a second and ask a question that that got some thumbs up. Uh, scroll, scroll, scroll. Where'd it go? Now I've lost it. I don't know what happened. Oh, here we go. OK, this is from Anonymous. Anonymous asks, thank you so much for this talk. If possible, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the appropriation and exploitation of black creators and their content on platforms like TikTok, for example. A black creator might choreograph a new TikTok dance, but instead of their content going viral, it's the content of white users who copy their content that do. Who is at fault for this phenomenon? Is it algorithmic bias? Is it the TikTok community? What is it and how can it be mitigated? Do you have thoughts on that? It's a little oh, field of what you were talking about, but I'm sure you got thoughts. I've got tons of thoughts. Thank you, Anonymous, for that question. You know, I think a lot of times we, you know, we want to assign blame, right? That's the easy way to go, right? To say, oh, this bad thing happened and that's the person that did it. Let's fix it. But I think with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these environments, you know, it's such a larger ecosystem, you know, so it's kind of harder to just like assign blame and say that this is the one space that happened, right? Or, or I could do the thing like, oh, white supremacy is white supremacy, you know? I could say that too, right? But then that's not leading us to like solution oriented kinds of things to figure out, you know, what, what is happening, what's transpiring. So there's a lot of things when we think about like the ecosystem of these spaces, right? So the, you have the users, right? But the users aren't just isolated, you know, sure they're bringing their own experiences into the space, but they're also informed by the climate and the environment of the space in which they're in. So if they're going into a space that doesn't really care about women's perspectives or, you know, folks of color, they're already adopting some of those perspectives, you know, because, because the platform doesn't really care about that either, which is why I say that, you know, what I, I, I always like to go back to Gamergate. So Gamergate, you know, we looked at like there was a few offenders who were doing a lot of harassment in the space, but I always argued that the gaming culture enabled and facilitated that because we did not have like a, a declaration that we cared about women's perspectives. And I think all these lawsuits and, you know, all the, the Me Too movement really highlighted just how much gaming has not cared about women. And that was the only only reason why, you know, Gamergate was able to happen. I love using Iris Marion Mary Young's Five Faces of Oppression to really think about, you know, the stages that, that are involved in leading to oppression, right? So you have to have some, uh, a marginalized, you know, population, but before a person, somebody's marginalized, you have devalued them. You know, you have rendered, you have marginalized them and their perspectives and their contributions. So there's like a pathway even before we get to like moments of oppression and moments of violence in there, right? Um, so so then who's at fault? So the it, when we think about like al al algorithmic bias, excuse me, so when we think about that, you have to remember there's a 
human on the other side that's coding and programming like all those kinds of things, right? So they're coding and a lot of the, the coding, sure, sure, some of it's just technical, but a lot of that, that human error and that bias is going into there. And, and from their lenses and their perspective, like through which they um, they, they see the world. But but that could only happen also if the, the user, the audience side, you know, has basically said, you know, we don't really care about this content. We we don't really care about, you know, black black perspectives or voices. So they feed into one another. So it's not like a one way street, you know, so it's like a it's like a going uh, a back and forth, um, you know, between like the culture and the creators and then the users and and the audiences, you know, all those things are feeding. So it's it's kind of hard to figure out a place of like where we're, we're going to intervene, like in this moment here, we have to really do it like in tandem um, with one another. Right. Hope yeah. that made sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's just fun to listen to you talk. When you get going, you go. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Somebody stop me. <laughs> fun to listen to you talk. I'm, just, um, I'm trying to think which, which direction to go now because there's a few different questions that, that take us in somewhat different directions. But um, I'm, I'm curious about James Ashley's question. Who, he, James asks, I'd always thought of esports as a space where East Asians have succeeded in displacing white men at the heart of nerd culture. Have they though? Even seen Sorry. through a Eurocentric lens and definitely through an Asian lens. And uh, he asks why you think they're still secondary. And I, I would be really interested also to hear your reflections on Asianness and gaming is its own intersectional thing that's not the right. same as blackness and gaming. And I would love your thoughts on yeah. on those two, com using those two examples uh, co comparatively, if there's things that come out of that, that that are interesting you'd like to speak to as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the things that, because I remember there was a few years ago, there was a publication that said, you know, gaming is primarily like a landscape of, it's primarily white and male, secondarily East Asian male, right? Um, but although the presence of bodies, you know, presence of bodies may be indicative of like diversity in a space. You have to think about what are their experiences in, in here as well. You know, Asian folks experience awful racisms in the esports world and in the gaming world. You know, there's all kinds of like essentialism. You know, they also have, you know, the myth of the model minority myths are happening. And even in spaces where there are, you know, the, the dominant populations or the Eurocentric populations think that they're taking up too much space or, you know, they feel intimidated by their presence. So there's all kinds of like isms um, that's happening like in, in that space as well. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I love the first part of, of the comment that's there, uh, you know, about the success of like East Asians, like in particular, there's no displacing of like white men though. You know, there, if we think about like the esports like landscape here, remember there were some teams that were upset. I won't name the name of the team, you know, but there was a team that um, they did tryouts for probably like a League of Legends like tournament. And on that tournament, it was the, the East Asian students that were on that campus that won all the spots, you know, because I think it was like uh, kind of tournament based and then they did a selection process through there. And so it was all East Asians. And so, um, you know, it was a fair trial, right? And they were the, the best and the brightest on the campus. But, you know, the the community, it was, a, it was a group of white guys, you know, they were like, this isn't fair. And so they 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 implemented like a quota system to ensure that, you know, the, and it was an international students. So, so it was, they were, the agencies were mostly international students and those, the, they implemented a quota to ensure that the international students um, weren't taking up too much space, right? Mind, there was never any conversations about, you know, like the, because uh, even after that, I think, you know, they succeeded in getting a few spots open. Um, but even after that, that, you know, there were no women on the team. So there were some women on campus that said, you know, because I think the, the women had their own thing, but then they were like, well, we need space in here as well. So what about us? But I think that a lot of the conversations around there, you know, really stemmed from conversations around Orientalism. You know, there are uh, racialized, white racialized anxieties that even go back to even like the 1800s of like just the presence of Asian bodies in spaces. Um, and then the response to them is have, have always been like racialized to, to like punish and restrict access. Um, and so, you know, uh, even uh, the conversation of like the model minority, right? You know, the model minority, you know, conversations were, were only in service to um, uh, for, for anti-blackness and so, so to support of, of white supremacy. So there was never any like thinking about like, oh, we want to create equitable spaces like for everybody here. They were like, these are desirable minorities. We prefer these desirable minorities, but we prefer these desirable Asian minorities as long as that they they are staying in the bounds and parameters in which we, we, we deem them acceptable. So any deviation outside of that, then it's met with swift, 
swift, swift punishment in, in, in most spaces. Um, so I think that, you know, it's why I love, you know, so many of, I, I love the domination of East Asian esports athletes in, inside these spaces. Um, you know, here's, um, um, uh, but, but then of course, you know, we have, um, I know I'm, I'm running out of time, you know, this was, we could have spent like a whole, whole lot of time here. Um, but something else that, that is really concerning, um, also is that, that there's this, um, they always want to, a lot of scholars want to lump conversations around like Asian-ness, like with whiteness as well. Um, and they all often bring up like conversations about, you know, like the anti-blackness that, that's seen in some of, some of these spaces. And I think just recently there was a streamer, um, she was a, it was a really prominent Asian streamer. She was espousing a lot of racist like rhetoric, a lot of anti-black rhetoric, a lot of homophobic and trans, uh, uh, homophobic and transphobic rhetoric. Um, and I think it was, it's, it's in those moments that, that a lot of folks like want to also like use to just illustrate, you know, how really to just get people out of spaces. I think that 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 case was really used to um, to push her out, you know, because also the experiences of like Asian women are drastically different, you know, from a lot of folks because of conversations of, of being exoticized and fetishized um, and not seen as like equitable, you know, like competitors in the spaces. So there's a whole lot in that space, James, um, is a whole you got to take two semesters of classes to just, just even understand, even just just to begin. You got to start with, you know, <laughs> some basic conversations of. <laughs> yeah, of right. And this is the point where we're getting yeah. questions. Yeah, now people are now people are dropping questions in the chat. Like, how do we do anti-racist design and technology? Which I'm so glad you're asking that because that is the question. But we can't answer that in the remaining <laughs> six seconds. <laughs> Thank Much you, Nancy. as I wish we could, but that is the question. I mean, that is the question. How can we move toward an anti-racist design and technology? I want to call out a couple other questions. Unfortunately, we were at the end, but I I, I did I had hoped to get to the question. We had one from asking if you had advice or thoughts for a group of diverse game devs that's past the seats at the table and is trying to make a game for black gamers specifically. And I wanted to suggest that whoever posed that question might reach out to me and I could get you in touch with Kishana uh, specifically because I, I think that would be a nice one to have been able to get answered. Um, along with all the others, which unfortunately, so many questions you don't get to, but um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being here. Reminder again that on March 30th, we're, uh, welcoming Dr. Tawana Dillahunt, who's an associate professor at the University of Michigan's iSchool, and she's going to be talking about um, community-driven employment innovation. She does some really fantastic work with marginalized job seekers in uh, the Detroit area and elsewhere, so strongly encourage you to come check out that talk too, and thank you so much, Kishana. It's always just fabulous, fabulous to see you and hear you speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate y'all. Ready for being here.